Good afternoon. Welcome to the Economic Forecast for Local Officials. My name is Lauren Palmer. I'm the Director of Local Government Services at the Mid-America Regional Council, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Please note that the slides from today's webinar are available as an attachment under the handouts tab in the GoToWebinar toolbar. In our routine dealings with local governments, we have learned that city and county governments, just like area businesses, are grappling with understanding the economic impact of the necessary public health precautions that have been taken to curb the spread of the COVID-19 virus. The purpose of today's webinar is to try to break down the economic issues that are facing our region and the needs resulting from the COVID-19 economic crisis. By the end of this session, you should have a better understanding of how the economy is doing at the national, state, and regional level, um, how what we can expect from recovery and how long recovery might take, which industries and occupations are most effective, and have a better understanding of what is the impact on vulnerable populations. And we trust you will use this information to assist you as you are managing your budgets and your services in your communities. Our webinar today features presentations from three panelists, and I want to just quickly introduce them. Donna Ginther is the Dean's Professor of Economics and the Director of the Institute for Policy and Social Research at the University of Kansas, and she is a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Her major fields of study include scientific labor markets, gender differences in employment outcomes, and equality, among others. Jim McDonald is the Chief Community Impact Officer of the United Way of Greater Kansas City. United Way supports more than 300 programs through allocations and other grants in the community impact areas of health, income, and education. United Way also administers 211 for a 2020 area. 211 is a free service for human service resources and referrals that is available 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Finally, Frank Link is the Director of Research Services for the Mid-America Regional Council, where he is responsible for overseeing the development of the region's economic and demographic forecasts upon which the regional transportation and environmental plans are based. Additionally, he manages the department responsible for collecting, maintaining, and analyzing the economic, demographic, and geographic information about the region. So for our agenda today, um, Frank will start, um, Jim will present second, and Donna will present third. Um, they will each have about a 15-minute presentation, and then we've reserved about 15 minutes at the end for audience Q&A. Um, we are committed to ending on time at 1 p.m., so to help us manage our time effectively, we'd like to reserve um, that question and answer period for the end. Um, we encourage you throughout the session to note your questions in the question box on the questions toolbar through the GoToMeeting toolbar. Um, and we will monitor and catalog those throughout the session and do our best to answer as many of those questions as we can during the question and answer time. So with that, I am going to hand controls over to Frank to get us started. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Make sure everyone can see that. So uh, we've been looking at this for a few months now. Um, we uh, the, the data that we use, uh, National Forecast in particular, gets updated every month. So this is based on uh, June data. It's just one part of what's going on in the region. Uh, you're as aware of everything as, as I am. I just wanted to take this moment to say that uh, the, the work is in part being funded by the Civic Council of Greater Kansas City to acquire the National Forecast from Moody's Economics. Um, and uh, it's being uh, done under the auspices of Casey Rising, the region's civic initiative to grow the economy for everyone. So we start with a, a macroeconomic forecast. Um, it comes again uh, from Moody's. This just shows you the, the history, the more re most recent history, and shows you the current um, employment picture compared to the Great Recession. So you can see in the Great Recession, we lost 8.7 million jobs. Um, we've lost 22 uh, million jobs uh, in the span of a couple of months, a, a slight rebound of 2.5 million 
but still um, lost nearly all the jobs we gained uh, during the economic recovery period. Uh, week after week, and there are new data released today, another million and a half people filed for unemployment insurance. Um, so that figure keeps going up. Um, this demonstrates the difficulty we have with our current data tools, understanding really what's going on because unemployment insurance claims go uh, have increased week after week, but also employment levels have increased according to the latest data. So it's hard to reconcile uh, some of the data. It will become clearer as we get more information, uh, but this is the sort of the fog of war that we're in right now. Uh, Moody's makes several assumptions about the the, the path of the economy and uh, regarding uh, fiscal and, uh, and monetary policy, uh, but some of the the most important assumptions really around the behavior uh, of, of of the virus. Uh, that there is no second wave. Um, there is some additional fiscal stimulus passed uh, by August, and it does include some aid to state and local governments to prevent uh, huge uh, budget shortfalls, uh, and that the unemployment insurance benefits that are scheduled to um, begin lapsing July 1st uh, are extended. Uh, they make variations around those assumptions and come up with a set of forecasts that looks kind of like this, where the range of, of uh, loss in uh, GDP this quarter could range from 25% to uh, 42%, um, uh, followed by a quick but partial rebound. Uh, and then depending on how the virus behaves and frankly how we behave, um, we could see another double dip if things get shut down again or we can see more of a, a continuous growth, uh, although you know not not at the same pace as we started out. You can see the difference in the different in the different assumptions, the path of the recovery uh, in this graph perhaps better. Uh, we're under under the best uh, assumption uh, in this this recession, uh, this recovery period, uh, which are probably already in. The economy's already started to rebound a bit, um, as uh, uh, you know it lasts until uh, lasts about a year before we're back to where we were uh, in February. Uh, or it could last uh, four years, uh, depending on, on again, how, how, how it all plays out with the virus and our behavior. This is just to show you, again, the relationship relative to the Great Recession, which was the worst recession you know, prior to this one, uh, since the Great Depression in the 1930s. It looks like just a little bump in the road compared to what we're undergoing right now. It's the same data, but visualized slightly differently, um, where uh, we're looking at percent change at annual rates. and. Again, back in 2008, 2009, that's, uh, our, heart, our economic heart sort of skipped a beat, uh, but now we're experiencing a heart attack uh, uh, that we're trying to recover from um, thanks to the, uh, to the pandemic. Uh, we expect on a quarterly basis, unemployment to reach um, 14% um, uh, uh, nationwide, uh, and uh, uh, you know, a quick drawdown, but still around 9, 10% by the end of the year, um, and then leveling off finally to 4.7% um, by the end of the forecast period, which is still significantly above the unemployment rate um, we had going into it, which were at record lows. So we take that data, we put it into our regional model for some, some uh, local regional data on what's happened so far. Uh, we've lost about 124,000 jobs so far. Um, so it, lo it looks like the, the, you know, the same things that are playing out na nationwide are playing out here. And our unemployment rates at 11.2%, which is two percentage points higher uh, than it was during the Great Recession. Uh, here I'm showing you the forecast in relationship to the Great Recession. So you can see in the Great Recession, um, uh, you know, we lost about uh, 55,000 jobs, peak to trough. Uh, here we're forecasting uh, 183,000 job loss, uh, peak to trough. Um, that may be overly pessimistic. The economy really has. Uh, started to recover and, and employment gains are, are upon us, uh, but nonetheless a huge uh, and unprecedented uh, drop in employment. But you can also see the Great Recession took a lot longer. In fact, by the end of the forecast period, if it was running now, we would we uh, we would still not be quite back to where we started. Whereas here uh, we, we reach uh, uh, employment levels equal to where we started in uh, 2023 uh, mid year. So in percentage terms, uh, about a 13 percent drop in, in employment followed, once we get to the recovery period, a 3.1% uh, improvement over where we started. Uh, and those are averages uh, for, the, for the entire region. Different sectors behave differently. Um, so to get an, an understanding of, of the sector uh, behavior, um, I wanted to show you just you know, what, what are the sectors that we have. Um, so uh, healthcare, professional scientific services, retail trade, state and local government, 
are the top four. Um, this is a data set, it's called the Bureau of Economic Analysis, that includes the self-employed, includes the includes farm. Uh, so it's the, it's the broadest definition of employment, but it does uh, locate um, public education inside state and local government. And that's unfortunate uh, if you really want to know what's happening to the education sector, uh, but it does a, a good job of showing you how much of our economy is dependent upon, uh, upon the state and local government uh, paychecks. And so if there is no aid coming to state and local governments, there are huge cutbacks that will that could help spur a, a second dip in the, in the recession. The industries that we specialize in, the things that we do more here than, than in the rest of the country um, are, are shown here in the, the, at the top. And so management of companies and enterprises takes a little bit of uh, explanation. It's a lot of back office work uh, where, where companies are being managed out of Kansas City, even though their headquarters might be someplace else. Um, but also um, uh, when Sprint was, uh, 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 majority interest in Sprint was acquired by SoftBank, it moved from information uh, which is where telecom is located into this sector called management of companies and enterprises. And then uh, we have a, a federal civilian presence that is higher than average, 38% higher than average, professional technical services, 30% higher than average, and so on, finance and insurance, wholesale trade, transportation, warehousing. Those are the sectors uh, that we that we specialize in here. Uh, some of the some of the ones that we that we don't, for example, would be like manufacturing. We have a lower than average share of our employment in, in manufacturing. Um, so if we look at it sector by sector, um, you can see that the, the, the ones that are uh, experiencing the sharpest uh, downturn are in arts, entertainment, recreation, uh, and then accommodation and food services. But the, the, the average of 13% is shown in orange here. You can see that um, you know, construction is also going to be hit maybe a little bit harder than average. Um, uh, a lot of the administrative support uh, is a lot of temporary workers that get laid off, contract workers, and so on. Um, but then at, at the bottom, uh, the ones that are more resilient are things that we do specialize in, the, the federal civilian, um, finance, insurance, and real estate management of companies, professional scientific services, um, so uh, wholesale trade. Uh, so we're, we're, we do better uh, uh, than, than uh, we have a special, the things that we have a higher proportion of our, our economy devoted to are actually a little bit more resilient. And that also shows uh, on the upside as well. Again, those temporary jobs come back in administrative support. But finance and insurance, wholesale trade, transportation, warehousing, and professional scientific services are all ones we specialize in, and they're all expected to rebound about twice as fast, more than twice as fast um, as the economy overall. Um, and then we, we converted that into uh, occupations. Um, and this, again, just showing you the kinds of occupations that we do here. It's a, it's a, it's a mix, as it would be anywhere, but a lot of office work, management, business finance work, healthcare, uh, food prep is a huge uh, sector. Uh, computer math engineering, retail sales, and so on. Uh, some of those are pretty resilient and some of those are not. Um, so we look at the kinds of occupations that are hurt, um, food, beverage workers, cooks, you know, other food preparation workers. These, these I should say, are occupations that employ at least 20,000 uh, in the metro. Uh, uh, building cleaning, uh, also not doing well. We, the construction trades uh, are expected to see a slowdown, retail trade, and so on. Uh, the ones that are, are, are a little bit more resilient, financial jobs, computer specialists, uh, sales uh, in, in things other than retail sales, like sales of services, also uh, fairly resilient. Uh, more more uh, business jobs, health jobs, uh, in, in, uh, also uh, fairly resilient. On the upside, um, the, the jobs expected to come back fastest are, are those computer occupations, the financial specialists. Again, that, that's the sales of services uh, shows up as being especially uh, resilient health diagnosing uh, occupations, but also some of the ones that, that you would expect just to pick up in any cyclical uh, kind of economy, uh, you know, motor vehicle operators, truck drivers, material moving workers, and the construction trades. Uh, some, 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 uh, you know, some industries that never quite get back, you know, those, those cooks and food prep workers uh, never, uh, never quite make it back to where they were by the end of 2025. So uh, my intent was to turn that into a retail sales forecast, but our model just has a difficult time uh, producing a good retail sales forecast. It tends to be a little bit too optimistic in my estimation. So rather than showing you a number I wasn't confident in, I decided just to show you some new data um, that, that is available uh, from uh, Raj Chetty's website, Opportunity Insights, uh, looking at high frequency data. Um, so this is based on, on credit transactions, a lot of it, so, you know, the change in consumer spending. You can see the economy is, in fact, uh, rebounding. This is saying that Kansas City 
right now is only 15% below where it was, uh, but it was you know 45% uh, below uh, when when uh, when the spending crashed. And so you can see uh, the economy is beginning to recover, but it is not uh, not back. This should be tightly tied to uh, to retail sales uh, uh, forecasts. So the, there's a the decline, but the decline is beginning to reduce uh, reduce itself uh, as we speak. Um, and here I, I threw on a couple of uh, comparison metros. So Nashville is not doing as well as we are. Uh, Minneapolis about the same. Um, they also can look at, at uh, expenditures at small businesses from these transactions. And here, uh, you know, it's down about 10%, a little bit under 10% uh, from uh, where it was at the beginning of January, uh, which is uh, better than I think most would have expected. Uh, still uh, a reduction for sure, uh, but also you can see uh, the beginnings of a trend upward. Um, and uh, similar for just the, the small businesses that are that are open, there's been a, a, a sort of a recent surge in that, although also it seems to be leveling off uh, here in Kansas City, it's down about 7% uh, from before. And then, uh, then finally, sorry about that uh, notification across the top. Um, so, um, uh, uh, we're looking at the at the income of low income workers uh, and at small and medium sized businesses, and here um, uh, you know low income folks really are are, are not yet participating uh, in the recovery. Overall, spending's up, businesses are reopening, but low income workers still are being hurt, uh, still uh, very very much near the the depths of their uh, of, uh, of of their loss of income, uh, down about thirty five percent here uh, over. Um, uh, of where we were in, in, in January. So, you know, in summary, uh, this is a bad recession. There's no, you know, there's nothing that we can uh, say about that other than that. But it would have been a lot worse uh, without the exceptional monetary and fiscal response coming out of Washington. More is required, uh, or we in or we are in danger of still another double dip uh, recession. Um, so, a quick but partial rebound. Uh, by the end of the year and then the path after the, that depends on, on the virus and on our behavior um, our ability to contain it which doesn't look all that great right now and that there will be another uh, round of stimulus uh, from the federal government that at least in part targeted to state and state and local governments um, it is uh, true that our occupation and, and industry mix appears to give us some um, some protection you know we're, we specialize in things that are more resilient uh, but we're still losing a, a ton of jobs. It's going to be hard to come back. Uh, confidence will be shaken. Business investment uh, will be sluggish. Uh, consumer spending uh, won't uh, won't fully uh, lock in uh, until uh, until there's more confidence about the path of the virus, and that will happen until we probably get a get a a vaccine uh, in a year or so. Um, so we don't expect a full blown recovery until then. We're going to get a quick rebound, um, and and so on. And then moving forward, the the regional economy. Uh, you know, really rebounded more slowly than our peers uh, after um, after the Great Recession. And the question is, how can we avoid that again? There's a lot of uh, work, good work going on in the community about looking at the kinds of industries that that are going to be more competitive, more resilient, uh, and the kinds of workforce that we need, and the kinds of skills that we need. Uh, and so uh, those efforts need uh, need to ramp up in order to to make sure that we do, in fact, rebound stronger from this recession than we did. Uh, the Great Recession. And I will um, stop. I can figure out how to share share my screen again. I All don't right. seem to have that. Uh, can you take it back? I can't I can't seem to give it to you. Thank you, Frank. Okay, so now we're going to transition to Jim, who's going to give us a perspective from impact on the social services community. Jim, I'm going to hand the controls over to you. Are you able to share your screen or do you need me to do that? I think I'll be able to. I'm going to turn my camera off, though, because uh, I have been having a little bit of a connectivity issue. Okay, great. Okay, so if I cut out, someone just please give me a heads up. Um, I'd like to share some perspective from United Way and the social sector um, more broadly. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis has been an interesting time for the sector, to say the least. Uh, social service providers 
are, are closely connected to some of the most vulnerable uh, people during the crisis. Uh, Low-income households, especially people of color and immigrants, older adults, those with underlying medical conditions, uh, people experiencing housing instability uh, or food insecurity, um, or those with other risk factors such as people experiencing mental illness, domestic violence, or struggling with addiction. Um, at United Way, we've spent a lot of time uh, learning from the social service providers how the crisis has impacted the families they serve um, and also the ways that they've adapted and how they serve those families. United Way of Greater Kansas City, as you heard, operates the region's 211 uh, information and referral line serving a 23-county region. Uh, 211 offers a 24-7 uh, phone number residents of the region can call for help getting connected to community-based nonprofit or government programs uh, that address a wide range of health and human services. So on a daily basis, we're receiving calls uh, from many of these vulnerable groups and making referrals to community services. Traditionally, the top needs that we see at 211 relate to basic needs, so food insecurity, housing instability issues, um, and other things related to uh, poverty or scarcity. So here's a snapshot of calls to 211 uh, by category. And these numbers are, are from during the pandemic and are generally reflective of the most frequently requested services uh, by callers uh, to 211 uh, and users of our online uh, resource database, which is a publicly available uh, searchable database uh, with the same information that uh, someone can get by calling 211. When the pandemic hit, we braced for an uptick in calls um, which typically occurs during a crisis or an economic recession. Uh, however, uh, that's not exactly what we saw. So after an initial spike in calls, uh, a 40% increase for a typical uh, over a typical month uh, in that first month of the crisis, uh, the call volume declined significantly and then leveled off. Uh, after several months, we're only now seeing call volume climb to normal levels. Uh, calls have begun to rise uh, from the low numbers we saw at the peak of the shutdown uh, and are now running at a typical level of 1,000 uh, plus calls per week. Uh, and we expect that number to continue to climb. And for reasons I'll touch on in a moment, we're, an we're anticipating continued uh, growth and, and even potentially dramatic growth in calls for help, uh, particularly within certain need categories. Uh, we've speculated that the drop in calls through much of the shutdown uh, were attributable, attributable to a few things. Um, so first, the tremendous way that our community stepped up uh, to make sure that no household experienced hunger during the crisis. Uh, tr tremendous amounts of uh, new government resources were dedicated to food insecurity, and then all the public-private partnerships in place to address food insecurity, whether it be Meals on Wheels, uh, the school lunch program, uh, the, the regional network of, uh, of food banks and food pantries um, and served meals programs all worked over time to meet the need of low income uh, and otherwise vulnerable populations during the pandemic. Uh, this involved an incredible amount of ingenuity to get the food to families in a way that was safe and supported social distancing. So food pantries all adopted drive through models. Served meal programs provided takeout and schools replaced traditional school lunch program by distri distributing um, sack lunches, um, and in some cases, meal kits and even boxes of produce to their families. Um, an another thing is that we expect that the drop in requests uh, for assistance are a reflection that federal intervention through the CARES Act um, and other action by Congress and federal agencies had uh, their intended impact, um, and that is stabilizing families. Um, the economic stimulus payments gave households the resources they needed to cover some of their most important uh, household expenses uh, during the crisis. And actions by state and local authorities, as well as by private industry, such as the moratorium on evictions um, and utility disconnections um, that we've seen really in most places throughout the region, um, have kept many households from experiencing crisis uh, for now anyway. Uh, but my fear is that many households will have experienced um, a false sense of security as a result of these measures um, and that they've not kept current on their uh, household expenses, particularly rent and utility pay payments. Um, anecdotal reports from area 
uh, utility providers and a local housing authority really bear this out. Uh, the cumulative arrearage among customers of area utilities is at historic levels, um, and the number of public housing and Section 8 renters who are behind in their rent is shockingly high. Um, I, you know, I heard um, this morning that the uh, one of the major utilities will be ending their disconnect moratorium uh, after 4th of July. So, um, you know, we're really bracing for um, a spike in the number of requests for utility assistance in particular. Uh, and then the tens of thousands of area renters with um, housing subsidies really are among, um, so that's people in public housing um, who have a Section 8 voucher. Um, they're really among our community's most vulnerable. So losing the, the critically valuable resource of a housing subsidy is much worse than typical eviction. Not only does the eviction, um, you know, basically put new housing out of reach because they have that eviction on their record, uh, but market rate housing um, for those in subsidized housing was really on a, or, or already unaffordable to those households. Households. Uh, conventional wisdom uh, among social service providers um you know is that the sector cannot do it alone uh the um the real help needed by families um that the agencies serve you know really must come in the form of additional stimulus uh, by the federal government um and longer lasting policy fixes um but you know i think the concern is of course that these do not appear imminent or assured by any means um so here i want to share just a few more stats uh, both from united way and, a, and one other source that point to some of the biggest challenges ahead. Uh, Pre-COVID calls to 211, callers to 211 who identified as homeless or at risk of homelessness have increased by about one third. And currently uh, they represent 25% of callers. Calls from people seeking help who are unemployed, um, which is typically, typically about half of callers to 211, rose by 34% uh, during the peak of the shutdown. And while it's improved a bit, last week it was still 25% higher than pre-COVID. And there is this stat that captures the extent to which uh, people are having trouble remaining current on their rent. Uh, the National Multifamily Housing Council and Industry Group has a rent payment tracker um, that covers 11 million um, units nationwide. And this, this source reported last month, a year over year, 23% increase in households who were not current on their rent. Um, you know, just a few thoughts about what I have been referring to as the looming eviction crisis. Pre-COVID-19 eviction was already at crisis proportions, um, you know, in our community. In Jackson County alone, there are about 9,000 eviction cases filed annually in the two courthouses uh, that, that hear, um, you know, eviction cases in the county. Uh, the moratorium on evictions was a critically important stopgap, as this graph demonstrates, um, but one that has ended in Jackson County, at least. I should point out that while uh, cases, you know, were not heard from mid-March through the end of May, uh, cases were still being filed. Uh, so when the 16th Circuit Court resumed operations at the start of the month, um, evictions resumed with a backlog of more than 700 cases awaiting action um, in the two courthouses serving Jackson County. Scores of additional cases are filed each week. 162 eviction cases have been filed in the month of June, um, just in the first two weeks. Um, you know, and I expect that uh, by the end of the month, we'll be looking at a number that's double uh, the number of filings in the month of May. Um, United Way is partnering uh, with our friends at MARC and the Greater Kansas City Coalition to End Homelessness and area legal service organizations on a strategy to prevent uh, as many of these um, eviction cases as possible, or as many of these cases as possible uh, from turning into a, um, an eviction. Um, one of our strategies is to turn to, um, you know, county leaders um, to ask them to invest a portion of the CARES Act funding that, uh, that you know, that, that they're um, responsible for um, into an eviction prevention strategy. The last topic, topic I'll touch on quickly is childcare. So this is an area that United Way is heavily invested in, both uh, in the early education space and school-age childcare. Uh, there's something like uh, 300,000 school-age youth in the region, um, and about a third of them are in the age range that need care after and before and after school hours, uh, and a similar numbers uh, in the zero to five age range. We don't take many calls at 211 on this topic, so I don't have uh, data uh, to share with you. 
Um, and, and the reason we don't take that many calls is because Kansas City is fortunate to have child care aware, a, ded a nationwide dedicated uh, resource and referral resource uh, for parents seeking quality child care. Um, and locally here, Family Conservancy does this work. Um, but no conversation about the economic impacts of COVID-19 is complete without a discussion um, of child care. Um, we're staying in touch with our early learning and out-of-school time partners and trying to monitor the extent to which child care is a growing need uh, as more workplaces you know, start resuming uh, regular operations um, as we look to the, uh, to the you know, approaching start of the school year. Um, during the pandemic, there was a drop in the demand uh, for typical child care services, of course. Most of the early learning centers, for example, uh, closed their regular programming um, and then temporarily shifted to supporting parents at home um, and trying to educate their young children. Um, essential workers, of course, continued to need care uh, for their children, and several providers stepped up in some really creative ways, I think, to fill this need. Uh, YMCA, for example, uh, refashioned its closed community centers into school-age child care facilities, uh, and area parks and rec departments really just took quick action to help uh, fill the gap. Um, and this was particularly important as the most common site for school-age child care is a school building, uh, and they were for the most part closed. Uh, my sense is that during this period, extended family support systems um, and neighborhood and other kind of social support networks uh, were critical to filling the child care gap. Um, and so as schools reopen, it remains unclear how many of them will be offering in-person before and after school care options, or re really even how many of them will even be offering in-person in options on a daily basis um, in terms of the, the core education program. Um, but those that do will be called upon to offer uh, before and after care. Um, and so to maintain proper social distancing, facilities capacity will essentially be cut in half. Uh, and the cost of care will surely go up as the staffing ratios get revisited and the cost of ensuring a safe environment uh, are factored in. Um, organizations like the Kauffman Foundation, Family Conservancy, Link, and Turn the Page KC are playing um, a really important role right now in helping to uh, lead a dialogue among uh, community partners in this space um, about the plan for out-of-school time options for families um, as the start of the school year approaches. I think that's, yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Jim. Yeah. We are gonna transition now to our third and final presentation from Donna as we do that. I just wanna remind everyone to be submitting your questions through the question box and um, we will do our best to answer all of those at the end of the session. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Uh, it was great to hear uh, Frank and uh, Jim's presentation. Um, I uh, direct the Institute for Policy and Social Research at KU and we've been updating our website every week. And we do that to synthesize data on the coronavirus in Kansas and focus on economic indicators. Uh, we posted another uh, briefing that's very similar to what I'm talking about today, uh, last night. And I wanna acknowledge my staff uh, members, Zan Weedle, Thomas Becker, and Lindsay Jorgensen who helped with these slides. So today I'd like to update you on the coronavirus in Kansas and the US. Um, I'm gonna focus mostly on the Kansas side because that's uh, the data we've been using and talk about what's happened to the economy so far. So my uh, presentation will dovetail nicely with Frank's uh, forecast. Uh, we're gonna compare Kansas to the rest of the country and we have some data, some of the similar data that Frank showed you on, uh, on the metro area. And then we talk about uh, the recovery and uh, there's a new shape. It used to be, you know, a discussion of V versus uh, you or whatever, and now the newest shape is the reverse radical recovery. Um, so we got some bad news yesterday. We set a daily all-time record of cases in the country. Uh, the United States now has 2.38 million cases and uh, over 121,000 deaths. Uh, Kansas has over 13,000 cases and Missouri has close to 20,000, but uh, you'll notice that the U.S. cases per 100,000 are about 738, uh, and Missouri's cases are much higher at 1,000 per 100,000. Um, this is a, a new figure. We we're looking at the percentage change in COVID cases by county across the country. Uh, everything in red, dark red, is a 50% increase in cases in the past week. Teal colors are reductions. 
Um, cases are increasing in the Sun Belt in Florida, Texas, Arizona, California, and up the West Coast. And this is bad news because if the virus gets out of control again, uh, we're going to have to take extreme measures. Um, in Kansas, our cases have varied by county. Uh, two of these counties, three of these counties are actually considered to be in the metro area. Um, you see that uh, cases are increasing, except for Leavenworth. Leavenworth had a steep increase, and that was uh, testing the prison population. Uh, Douglas County cases, which have been flat, you know, they look like nothing's happening, actually have increased 54% since June 2nd. Um, if you look at daily average cases in Kansas, what you see is since the 1st of June, a, a steep increase in the seven day moving average. And uh, this is bad news because according to my colleague at the University of Kansas Medical Center who does daily forecasts of cases, it takes about five weeks for the mobility data uh, to feed into our model of our, to show up in the cases. So these numbers don't reflect Memorial Day yet. And we know that there's been a lot more mobility in the Kansas City metro area since Memorial Day. So cases are going to increase in the next few weeks at an increasing rate and deaths come with a lag. So we haven't even started to see an increase in the death rates from this increase in cases. Uh, so uh, we're going to have to change how we think about this virus in terms of our behavior and the economy. This is a graph uh, that was earlier in the week in the Washington Post. You see in the United States and the European Union had around similar timing of peaks in cases. Uh, the United States numbers actually are up here now, but um, the European Union uh, was able to get cases down to a manageable level. But our U.S. policy response has not been sufficient. It sort of bent the curve uh, through the beginning of June, and then things are out of control again. Uh, access to the vaccine, those forecasts that uh, Frank presented, uh, assumed the creation of a vaccine. Even if we get a vaccine by January 1st, getting 300 million people potential doses of the vaccine are going to be next to impossible. So a year from now, uh, people may not be widely uh, vaccinated. So that leaves behavior change. And uh, I, I want to preach about wearing masks. Um, people have not been wearing masks. And it, it's clear that if you wear a mask, if an infected person wears a mask and a healthy person wears a mask, transmission rates are very low. So our key to controlling the virus and to improving the economy will depend critically on changing our behavior and mask wearing needs to be a part of that behavior change. Now I'd like to talk a bit about the Kansas and the U.S. economies. Um, a stock market fell significantly yesterday on news about the increase in cases. So the economy is going to respond to the virus. And so we need to think about health policy and economic policy as being one and the same. As of yesterday, the Dow was down about 13%. Uh, and all of a sudden things are freezing on me. Can people hear me? We can hear you, can hear but you. image has frozen. You are frozen. Yeah. I am frozen. My The little wheel of death is going. I can't move my slides at all. But the um, audio is fine. Uh, Lauren, could you take control? And yeah. Can you see me or just the slides or? We see a frozen picture of you. All right. You may have to figure out where you were in your slides. You are very expressive in this uh, frozen picture. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll, I can talk through my slides. If you go to the next, if you take away and share a version of my slides, I can talk over and tell you when to move to the next slide. I have this on a different computer. Great. Can you see the slides, Donna? I can't see anything. My computer is frozen. Okay. Um, 
So if you go to the stock market slide, um, and then advance to the next slide. Okay. Industrial production and retail sales. Yes, uh, so industrial production and retail sales rebounded uh, in May. Uh, but even if you take into account the steep increase in, in industrial production, it's uh, still down 6% compared to last year. Uh, the next slide shows that our weekly economic forecast of the downturn is a minus 8%, which has improved over time. The next slide shows that uh, unemployment claims in Kansas and Missouri uh, remain stubbornly high. Uh, you know, in um, Missouri on June 13th, 17,000 claims were filed in Kansas, 8,300 claims. New data just came out this week, but I haven't incorporated it yet. Um, the Kansas economy, uh, this, this next slide lists uh, the industries where people work the most. So in Kansas, it's government, health, manufacturing, and retail. 53% of the workforce uh, uh, in Kansas work in those industries. And I took aggregate claims, initial unemployment claims, and divided by the labor force, and that gives you a kind of a measure of unemployment. It's an overestimate of actual unemployment, but it shows you which sectors have been hit the hardest. And of the big sectors, it's manufacturing and to a lesser extent retail. Uh, you see like 55% of entertainment uh, workers have filed a claim at some point in the state, but that's a very small share of the state economy. This next slide shows Kansas industries uh, with cumulative job losses and uh, over 70,000 now of manufacturing workers in the state have filed an initial claim at some point during March. Um, that's followed by food services, health assistance, retail trade. And if you add up all of these claims, there are about 68% of people who have filed for unemployment. The next slide uh, includes initial uh, cumulative claims by county. So between March and June 13th uh, on the slide deck on my computer, um, I, uh, had, I actually updated that figure. Uh, you'll see Sedgwick County uh, has over 84,000 initial claims since March. Johnson County, uh, with the latest data, is now over 50,000 initial claims as a result of the COVID crisis. Uh, let's skip this the next slide and then go to the next, which is now for the good news. Kansas is actually doing better than the rest of the country. Can you all still hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Because uh, my computer's completely frozen. Um, if you go to the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, Kansas uh, got a lot of money, about $4.9 billion. Uh, they the fourth in terms of the total amount of firms. Uh, being covered and uh, covered a lot of the payroll. So uh, Kansas was uh, did pretty well. Missouri ranks 15th in terms of total funds from the PPP. Um, the Census Bureau, if you go to the next slide, the Census Bureau is um, doing a weekly pulse survey of uh, households and of uh, small businesses. And our household pulse survey shows that uh, only 39% of Kansas households have lost employment income, and that's compared to a 47% rate in the US as a whole. Uh, food scarcity in Kansas is similar to the US as a whole, and Kansans report lower rates of delayed medical care and housing insecurity. Uh, Let's skip uh, to a closer look at the KC Metro. And if you go to slide, uh, the slide uh, with uh, Kansas City Metro initial unemployment claims, uh, this is through June 13th. Uh, there have been 196,000 initial claims on the Missouri side and about 120,000 on Jackson County alone. Far fewer, about 70,000 on the Kansas side. Uh, 
Uh, we don't have the unemployment rates by county in um, on the Missouri side for me, but we do have it uh, for Kansas. This uh, next slide shows the unemployment rate by county uh, in April, and uh, it's about 14.8% uh, in, in Wyandotte County. That number is dropped in May to 14%. So unemployment is edging downward in May, at, at least on the Kansas side from what we know. The next slide uh, shows uh, consumer spending uh, in Kansas, uh, Missouri, and Iowa. Missouri and Kansas uh, are doing about the same in terms of uh, consumer spending. It's down, you know, one to three percent. Iowa's uh, expenditures are down about 13 percent. And these data are from the tracktherecovery.org. Uh, that uh, Frank also featured. The next slide uh, compares Kansas, Missouri, and Iowa to the number of small businesses. Uh, Kansas businesses about uh, are down about 11 percent. Missouri's 14 percent and Iowa 16 percent. At its worst, about 25 percent of Kansas small businesses were closed and that that downturn was much more dramatic for Missouri. The next slide shows that Johnson County small businesses uh, have done fairly well compared to other small businesses in the state. The number of small businesses open in, in Kansas, again, is down about 11 percent, and Johnson County is 11.6. Sedgwick County is doing relatively better uh, despite its high unemployment rates, and Douglas County is doing worse. Um, so we like to take some of the data that Frank showed and, and do it as a bubble graph, which is in the next slide. So it's uh, unemployment relative to gross uh, product. And we have uh, two examples of this, one for Johnson County and one for Wyandotte County. Uh, along the bottom axis, you see the share of industry for the county product. And along the y-axis, you have the unemployment rate by industry, uh, where unemployment is the sum of initial and continued unemployment claims in the county for last week. Uh, everything that is in blue is doing relatively well. Uh, the bubble is the size of employment. So you can see Can uh, Johnson County has its largest share of employment in professional. The health, retail, manufacturing, and information sectors are, are suffering, but their unemployment rates are below average. So uh, that's really good. What's in yellow are service sector industries that are a small share of the Johnson County economy that have relatively higher unemployment rates. Um, so Johnson County is the picture of economic balance. The next slide, uh, the scale changes, and that's for Wyandotte County. And you see that you know you have uh, approximately 35% unemployment in the education sector, uh, but it's a very small share of Wyandotte employment. But manufacturing, health, retail, and construction are struggling, and government seems to be propping things up. If you go to the next slide, uh, it's officially a recession, but what about the recovery? Uh, the next slide says that the NDER uh, said it was officially a recession in February 2020. Uh, it cannot be stressed enough that we've never seen a recession like this in our lifetimes. This is unprecedented, and coming out of it is also going to be a long haul. If you go to the next slide, it shows the shape of the economic recovery. This is the reverse radical uh, shape that uh, I was telling you about. 538, the website uh, surveyed macroeconomists and 73% said it would be a reverse radical. A V shape has no support. A swoosh shape, it, which was being offered as the ideal recovery a few months ago, uh, is also lessened in support. If you go to the next slide, you'll see the UCLA uh, Anderson forecasts and that the Recovery for GDP uh, returns in about two and a half years, but employment uh, is not going to recover uh, within that two and a half year time span, and it's that reverse radical shape. Um, 
The next slide is the argument that we continue to face a lot of economic uncertainty. The US economy still has a loss of 19 and a half million jobs. Uh, both uh, Frank's forecast from Moody's and, and this forecast from UCLA assume the creation of a COVID-19 uh, vaccine really soon. Uh, but what happens if that vaccine is delayed? Um, the downturn will be worse and the recovery will take longer if we have to return uh, to a significant economic shutdown. And given where COVID cases are, that's possible, which is very worrisome. And finally, there's an important date. On August 1st, extended unemployment benefits will end for millions of people creating economic hardship. Next slide. Uh, more fiscal stimulus is needed, in particular providing extended unemployment benefits because we still have double-digit unemployment and supporting the state and local governments, you know, bailouts for state and local governments that are doing the hard work of COVID, uh, addressing the COVID crisis. Uh, my next slide uh, just gives you, re shows the website where you can get updated versions of this information. And finally, I want to thank you for your time. And hopefully I can um, answer questions. I won't be able to see you, uh, but I'm here to answer questions. Thank you. Great. Well, I want to thank all of our presenters. Um, we have um, just a little shy of 10 minutes left, so we will try to answer the questions that came in via chat. Um, the first question I'm going to field to you, Frank, um, came from Dan Reese, and I don't know if you're able to see the questions in your chat box, Frank, but there are several questions about um, what kind of data you have access to. If you have data of unemployment filings by zip code or county, the number of cost burden renters, and if you're able to comment on whether or not cost burden is a common term. Hmm. Um, I, I'm, I find that getting good data by county has, has been difficult. Um, you know, even the unemployment insurance data on the, on the Missouri side has been difficult to get uh, by county and, and, and it's sometimes inconsistent. Sometimes it looks like there's actually been a, a drop in the number of, of unemployment insurance claims when it's not possible. So um, in terms of uh, unemployment uh, rate numbers, um, I, I depend on the same uh, data from, from Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, as, as everyone else. They don't have any special access to, to anything. Uh, rent burdened, um, uh, cost burden renters, is a is a typical term. Uh, it gets defined differently. Either 30 or 30 percent of income going to rent is is a typical definition of a cost burden. Uh, but the data that we get on that uh, is from the American Community Survey, and it's significantly lag. You know, the latest data is uh, is still 2018 data on that, so that's that's not useful in this particular circumstance. Uh, trying to get an idea on you know some of that the uh, eviction data or or others, more high frequency data is something that we are looking for. I'm open to ideas from anyone in the audience uh, if they've uncovered anything, uh, but, but we don't have uh, access to really good data on what's happening to, to renters uh, you know, right now. Um, it appears that government intervention has been essential to staving off the worst economic fallout from occurring. How likely do you see these policies to be continued heading into the fall? Well, my you know my crystal ball is always cloudy. It's cloudier now than than ever, I think. But you know, I, I think there's is appetite for additional uh, support. Um, I don't think anyone wants to uh, have things get worse just before an election. So I think there's there's some impetus uh, for some additional support. How long lasting? I think is a very uh, wide open question. After the Great Recession, uh, we very quickly turned to being concerned about inflation and, and debt levels. Uh, and sort of stopped uh, uh, policy response in mid in mid tracks, and that's one reason why it did uh, take so long to recover our employment. You know, six or seven years. Um, I think we've learned a bit of a lesson, but I also hear talk that uh, people are concerned about inflation and debt again. So that makes me a little nervous. We will stop too soon. Um, so I, I think uh, it would uh, be better from my standpoint if we didn't have to go to Congress every time we needed something new, if there were more automatic stabilizers built into the next law 
or a set of laws uh, so that it worked more like unemployment insurance uh, where it, it, it happens more or less automatically without requiring a whole new uh, you know, passage of a new law from Congress. Jim, this question may be best for you. It's concerning the eviction prediction. What is the dollar amount of the pending eviction cases? How much money would be needed to resolve those? Great question. Um, I don't have the answer to that in terms of the aggregate dollar amount, um, but you know we've c consulted with our uh, legal aid uh, partners, um, and you know they have uh, they looked at a num number of the pending cases when the court reopened in Jackson County. And it looks like right now um, uh, there's about $3,000 owed per case, and that would include pa unpaid rent um, and you know court fees and, and legal fees. Um, so for about $3,000, um, you know, and, and I hesitate to use the word on average because we haven't looked at all of the data, um, but we'd be able to resolve many of the cases, uh, you know, for about a typical amount of $3,000. Some of them are significantly lower than that. Um, then of course some are higher. Um, so you know, as a part of this, um, you know, uh, collaborative that we're trying to get off the ground in terms of eviction prevention by going, you know, to the, you know, to the, basically to those cases that have been filed in the court and offering assistance to those households. Um, you know, we're hoping to to reach um, a couple of thousand of them um, in the metro area. And if we can raise more money, um, you know, go go beyond that even. Um, so, but but the, uh, the legal assistance organizations are well positioned to more rapidly respond and intervene on behalf of um, a set of um, you know low and moderate income households facing eviction um, who typically don't get helped um, because of the amount of money that they owe. All right, we have just a few minutes left and three questions. I'm going to try to get through each of these. So the first is for Donna. Do you have an idea of whether or not the increase in COVID cases are a function of increased testing? Uh, well, Kansas, at least on, on the Kansas side, Kansas is a laggard in testing. So um, the average for tests per thousand people is 82 in the US and for Kansas it's 51. I think that's just a specious argument. Um, I, th I think that, you know, the cases are, are literally increasing testing is more widely available but uh i don't think it's just testing alone i think it's people got people got sick of staying home they started going out uh and um perhaps we're not as cautious as they should have been okay this is a question that I think would appeal to many in our audience do you have any recommendations for how the cares act fund should be allocated um, to, to be the most beneficial to businesses and individuals in need? Oh, that's a broad one. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, the problem with the CARES Act funds are that there are too many restrictions placed on them. Um, you know, there are all of these unexpected expenses associated with the, the coronavirus. There are all these public health needs. And, you know, then there are these downstream effects from the economic crisis. So I really think that um, uh, working with to get Congress to kind of loosen up how that money is spent would be in the best interest of state and local governments as a first order of business. Um, second, you know, you should prioritize uh, public health measures uh, because, you know, throughout this crisis, health policy feeds into economic policy and you, you know you saw it with the stock market yesterday that they you know all of the bad news about the covid cases really rocked the stock market and affected people's expectations so we're going to have to have a different mindset than we had in march in march we thought you know if we shut the economy down we'll get the virus under control and, and we turn to business as usual well, we didn't have the virus under control. We didn't. Uh, we can't return to business as usual. So we really need to, on the fly, you know, address our our behavioral response in order to have an econo an economy that is going to come back and recover. Great. So that that's how I kind of view how we need to spend that money. And Donna, just one final question for you, if you can expand on statement that government transportation and wholesale are doing well specifically how is government doing well well 
on the, and this is, you know, again, on the Kansas side, up until now, uh, there haven't been any layoffs uh, in, in the state and local governments, at least, you know, not significant on the Kansas side. Um, we're starting a new fiscal year next week. Um, and if there's not funds uh, coming from the federal government to shore up uh, revenues for the state and local governments, there will be an increase in layoffs in the in furloughs in the uh, government sector that will affect uh, how our economy is performing. Um, so I'm hopeful that the federal government recognizes that the state governments and local governments are doing a lot of heavy lifting and need, you know, the flexibility with the CARES Act money as well as additional funds to continue to perform the vital services that have uh, been required to help in this unprecedented uh, health and economic shock. I'm very concerned and, you know, I'm, you know, the social service numbers that Jim presented about calls to 211, I am expecting uh, if those enhanced unemployment benefits don't go up on August 1st, that your, your 211 line is going to be flooded with people who need food assistance and rent assistance and other things. You know, these, these unemployment benefits have been crucial to keeping people from, you know, losing house and home if they go away. Um, I am very afraid what September, October lo looks like. Well, on that very optimistic note, I want to <laughs> thank Frank, Jim, and Donna so much for being our panelists this morning and sharing some really great information that hopefully will, will be helpful to our um, cities and counties as they are making decisions about their budgets and preparing for um, future service delivery in their communities. Uh, thank you so much, and that concludes our webinar. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks, thank Frank. You.